Hello, my name is Jennifer Saran and I am the Volunteer Engagement Manager at the Los Angeles Public Library. With me today is... Chandra Jeffrey, the Mobile Outreach Librarian from the Engagement and Outreach Department. And it is our sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's Your Author Series featuring writer Darian Simone Harvin and illustrator Monica Ahanano as they discuss their new book, Black Icons in Her Story, 50 Legendary Women. Please feel free to use the chat box to send in your questions and comments and they'll be answered toward the end of the program. Also, don't forget to email ecdept at lapl.org for your chance to be entered into an opportunity drawing to win a copy of Black Icons in Her Story. We want to thank our generous donors, the Lenore S. and Bernard A. Greenberg Fund, as well as the Library Foundation and our amazing behind the scenes staff for helping the library bring these author and illustrator programs to you virtually. Thank you all so very much. We would also like to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land we recognize and acknowledge their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants. For more information on which territory you may reside, check out natives-land.ca. That's N-A-T-I-V-E hyphen L-A-N-D dot C-A. Now on to today's Your Author program. Monica Ahanonu is a Los Angeles-based illustrator and author who has created distinctive work in her signature bold and colorful style for the New York Times, Nylon, Time, In Style, Vanity Fair, Vice, Adidas, Netflix, Google, and many more trendsetting clients. As IMG Models first signed illustrator, Monica is emerging as a leading tastemaker in fashion while she continues to elevate her talents in illustration. You can find her on Instagram at Monica Ahanonu. And Darian Simone Harvin is a multimedia reporter using her journalism and curate curatorial skills to craft distinct narratives on beauty, pop culture, and the intersection of both. Her career has been dedicated to working on thoughtful and viral ways to present news and content to people for platforms like BuzzFeed News, Teen Vogue, NBC News, and Vox.com. She is formerly the beauty editor at large for Los Angeles Times Culture Magazine Image. You can find her on Instagram at Darian. Welcome, Monica. Welcome, Darian. Hello. Hi. How are you guys? Good. How are you today? Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, thanks for having us. We're excited. So excited. Thank you for having us. We're going to jump right in. We're excited to see and hear what you guys have to offer this wonderful public today. Absolutely. Do we have the slideshow? Yes, look at that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yes. Well, I figure we, I know that we have a series of slides of, um, of different women within the book, and I guess I'll just, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak to each one um, in kind of my writing and my thought process behind each one. I figured actually for my, uh, um, for my Angelou, I, I would read a bit of, of, um, of my intro because I think it's a good reflection of how I thought and went about um, thinking about looking at an entryway for, um, for, for each bio and for each woman, for each woman, I felt like I either went about it one of, one of two ways. One, I really tried to enter with a, with a, with some, um, with some sort of bold statement that, that I can then, that, that I knew that I could then like expand on. So for my Angela, I go, Maya Angelou is a great observer. She has always started with her own existence. She's wrote seven autobiographies. She's um, broken down by age span that have spoken to the humanity of her black girlhood, womanhood, and that of so many other black women. Angelou, um, Angelou has her own work. She has her own critical race theory and practice of feminism. She is 
the reference. Um, and so I just honestly uh, love writing this because I thought it was a really great way to, um, to just to show how Maya Angelou uh, always explored like all parts of herself, both as, um, as an author, as a, as a poet, um, as a, as a performer, as a, as a music artist. And so um, it was really intimidating to write this bio because Maya Angelou has been written about so much, but I really wanted to go in with something bold, so. Thank you, that is beautiful. Um, okay, Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams, I feel like she is such a multifaceted woman from being a novelist to a politician. I actually, what I really worked hard to do in this bio was to show how um, both like parts of her as like an author and a politician actually inform each other and how her ability to communicate um, and to break down a point or an argument uh, is something that I feel like she really honestly got from like her writing and research skills, um, not only as a young girl, but also as a writer and how she used that to like inform the public. So that was something really interesting I learned about her. Yeah, I mean, Stacy as well for this one, um, I just wanted to kind of like get a little bit of her energy and how bold she is um, in the portrait. And so, you know, the color for the background is bright and bold. It's like her and, um, you know, just a little bit of movement around the page to add with everything. Yes, this is one of my favorite um, <laughs> portraits and also one of my favorite bios to write. Um, mm -hmm. When I was thinking, when Monica and I were both thinking about women that we wanted to be within this book, I wanted women that were not only um, across different um, uh, multi like disciplinaries, music, film, fashion, STEM, but also I wanted to show iconic women that um, that were iconic in their own right. I wanted to show different kinds of iconic women. I didn't mm -hmm. want the book to feel like there was there was there was some respectable way to be an icon. And so for me, when I think about um, Cardi B, um, her background as a black woman, um, being Afro Latina, um, being from the Bronx, um, and also being, uh, a, uh, I think we're going to really look back and see, um, and, and not only see Cardi B as a, as a, as a pioneering like woman rapper, but just a, a pioneering rap, like rapper of, of, um, of her era. And so I wanted to include her in the book along with little Kim as a way to <laughs> kind of just like show that, um, like how both of them actually represent the future. Yeah. Yeah. Monica, I want to hear, I want to hear your thought process behind this photo, this illustration. Okay. <laughs> I mean, for me, so when I'm doing my art in general, a lot of things are just very intuitive and I'm not, I don't think too deeply a lot of the times about it. It's more like the feeling of how this person comes across to me and Cardi B, I love her and I love her energy. And she's like, I just, like I know how she is and how she's just out there with herself and um, just the way that she presents herself with her art and her music and her music videos. And so I kind of wanted that with her expression mainly. It's something very different from the rest of the portraits because she is, you know, very different in, you know, the way that she does her things. But yeah, this one is just like the color, um, very warm tones, um, just like her and things along those lines. Octavia E. Butler, yes. I um, One of the really amazing things, I, I actually kind of lead with this within the bio, but I talk about how um, kind of the, um, the experience, I'll just read a little bit of it, and kind of how Octavia Butler herself was introduced to her own love of writing. Um, I say, it is an experience to develop a love, to have a fire lit in you for something you don't have the proper name for yet. It's the rush of a felt feeling to explore new territory without shame or hesitation. This is what happened to award-winning author Octavia Butler. And then I start to go into um, her love for the library, how she started reading sci-fi books before she knew what that genre was um, herself. You know, she was just looking for looking for books that she was interested in reading. And so I loved um, exploring like her creative process and how she went about um, crafting her own stories while I was writing her bio. And then for the portrait, um, this one, you know, that's a lot softer, softer tones overall, but more muted and calm, but like powerful. Uh, and that's just kind of how I see her and saw her. And so I wanted to put that in, you know, the piece. 
I talked about when um, when I was looking at um, when I was doing research and I was looking for an entryway to start the bios for for all of these women. Either I started with a really bold, definitive um, statement, or I tried to talk about like a breaking point within their lives where it kind of represented them going down a path um, that led to them ultimately being an icon in many ways because they chose themselves, their own dreams, their own desires, um, and they took a big risk on themselves. And so I think that there are so many moments within Misty Copeland's life, honestly, that I learned where she, um, where others were advocating for her or she really had to learn how to advocate for herself, especially within the ballet world. Um, so I learned a ton of things about Missy Copeland during my research that I thought I knew about her um, that, I, that I didn't, so that was amazing. Yeah, and for me on the, the you know visual side, um, I obviously wanted to include a lot of movement around the page because she's a dancer and so it felt necessary, you know, with her very still posing, um, like for her portrait, I wanted there to be moving around her because you know, as a ballerina, you do a lot of movements, but then there's a lot of pauses with those movements and a lot of like holding positions. So it's a bit of a balance of those two things, kind of being able to put that in the portrait. Laverne Cox. Laverne Cox is one of my favorite people, entertainers, um, actresses. It was really important to us to make sure that we were including, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that we, that when we, um, that for me, when we say, when we, you know, we say that this is a book of um, of black women icons, it included trans women and it also included um, Afro Latino women as well. And so um, I think that uh, Laverne Cox, you learn uh, uh, actually, in fact, within the bio, I really try to talk about um, a lot of the advocacy work and writing that she did even before she became really well known on Orange is the New Black. Um, so I, I love writing her bio and just really expanding on her brilliance, even as a producer. Um, yeah, for me, for Laverne, this one was kind of just another one that was intuitive. Uh, I really liked, I mean, the way this one came out, I really like her hair and like how it shapes her face and the movement of it. So I'm just really happy with this, how this came out. And yeah. Yes, <clears throat> Celia Cruz. I, um, Celia Cruz was someone who I knew that I wanted to include, especially after talking actually like to my other, to my other, to like my own Afro-Latina friends, really talking to them about like, who do you admire within, within your culture? Like, who would you want to see within this book? And Celia Cruz was like, was top of that list for so many of them. And, um, I really, what I, what I really love about, about her life was, quite frankly, how much of like in her time, she was a, she was a, a modern day world star. She was, um, she was traveling um, along with the band and really playing around the world um, while she was also like helping to shape um, a, a genre that would go on to influence many other genres. Um, not only that, but she was, um, she, uh, she was also a, um, you know, she's a, she's a Cuban woman. She is a, she's a black woman. And I also really tried to include like the politics of, of being that during her time and um, what that meant for even her personally and how she continued to make music. Um, for me, for this portrait, I, I definitely wanted it to have a lot of like energy to it. Um, this one I kind of, I think is one of the few portraits where I used the texture for her necklace. Um, I just know she wore a lot of like glitz and glam. And so I wanted that to show through in this portrait. And then also with the bright color combinations that she would always wear. Um, I wanted to just have that into this piece and have the energy come through of who she was. Angela Davis. I, it would, um, where do I even begin? It was so important to, for me to have um, black woman activists within this book. Angela Davis, um, to me, also is someone who, you know, a lot of, of the work that I do within beauty is like beauty, pop culture, politics. And so when we think about Angela Davis and her influence, not only within like the, the political world, but, but within like the pop culture zeitgeist, I think that she's just someone who, for me, when I, um, I don't think that Angela Davis would, would necessarily like call like personally call herself an icon, but I think that there is a lot around her work and, and what she does that um, that has influenced the Black Lives Matter movement, that has influenced um, organizing around social justice, and also has influenced like the kinds of books that we that um, that we read, what um, what we, what we think about um, abolition, what we think about um, 
social justice reform. So this was also like, um, I also think that she has such a, um, such a, a, she has such a um, like a complicated history because of her because of her own political beliefs that didn't always run in tandem to the um, to the U.S. government. And so I think like figuring out ways to to like tell a little bit of like those nuances while still showing like how just incredibly brilliant she is. It was like something I really wanted to um, to show. You know, the aspiration of all these women, but also the reality of what they went through when they were in the thick of doing all the things that we know them for being great for now. Yeah, and for me, for the portrait, um, I just wanted to get her attitude across kind of a lot of things that Darian's saying is she kind of did her own thing or did things her own way. And so I wanted to kind of come across with her expression um, in this one and kind of a calm but stern focused expression. Um, and the same with the shapes moving around in this piece. Ava DuVernay, uh, what I really love about Ava DuVernay's um, career, and I also think that this is this is true for Maya Angelou, um, Toni Morrison um, as well. Um, they were women who, what we know them for now today, they, um, they it was maybe like their, the, kind of like their second iteration at, at, at their career. They're women who we began to, um, who really started to gain notoriety when they were out of their 20s and 30s, when normally we live in this culture that, um, you, you know, we, we value youth in, in this in this way. And so I love really like adding in or kind of like entering into Ava DuVernay's bio of like, she started in publicity in the film world, being on set, she decided that she wanted to start to tell her own stories. And basically her training was being on set as, as a publicist and kind of learning that way. And then instead of instead of complaining about the stories that she didn't see, like she just started to make them. And so I think that there's so much to just to that mindset um, that I, I really liked expanding on with, within her bio. Yeah, and for the portrait for this one, I was really happy with how her hair came out. Um, doing all the details of the braids and the lighting on her face. Um, and she's just such a like stoic, you know, confident person. And so I wanted that to show through with the posing and the, the lighting that I chose for her. Amanda Gorman, it's like so hard not to write. It was so really hard not to write her bio and like be poetic my, like myself because <laughs> because when you um, read about her and when you read her work, I felt like it just comes through to you. And so um, I felt like this was one of like the shorter bios that I wrote, but I still felt like it was like succinct and really powerful. And it kind of spoke to like the length of some of the bios, like is not a reflection of, you know, the value of any of them. It was just more for me around like, a, a style and what I could, um, and what I really wanted to get across. And so um, I'm, I, I almost felt like I tried to leave some of the bio as like, you know, her, her journey in many ways, um, we have so much more to witness from her um, in addition to all of the things that she's already done, so. Yeah, Amanda, um, we all know this the headband that she wore um, during the inauguration when she did her speech. And I just really loved that look of her. Um, and so I decided, include that in her portrait and, you know, her expression. She just has like such a warm smile um, and getting, you know, like her cheeks correct. So this one was actually one of the harder ones. I don't know. I didn't think it would be as hard as it was to get her expression right, but I remember this one took me a while. I kept having to go back to it, trying to tweak things to make it look just right. So you could recognize her fully. Um, Marsha P. Johnson, yes. I, um, again, was really just excited and happy to include um, Black trans women within the book and to also to, um, to add um, a glimpse of um, the, the gay rights movement within the, uh, within the 80s and 90s, specifically within New York, that, or the 70s, 80s and 90s within New York. And so um, I felt like what I really tried to do with, with in fact, with Marsha P. Johnson was to show how she was a rebel, to show that she was like, quite frankly, someone who was a leader um, within this very um, like grassroots movement. And also that she was that someone that was also um, just like forming, you know, even as she was helping herself, she was helping other youth. Um, at that time. And so mm -hmm. um, it was also just incredible to, to me to learn about even just um, the way that she, that she um, viewed herself. Um, I, I say this in the conclusion of the bio, but it's Marsha P. Johnson. The P is for um, like 
like pay it no mind, like 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 pay my gender no mind. And so I still felt like you know, at, um, at, as someone who identified as a woman and being and being femme, um, but still you know like pay it no mind, like this is this, I'm Marsha P. Johnson, this is me, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and playing along or like you know carrying on with that is like the same thing with the portrait. It's like you know I wanted to show how loud she was about who she who she was and not afraid to just show who she was and be herself. Um, and so, you know, the flowers and everything. Um, this one's, you know, based on a, a picture of her um, that I, I had seen that I really love. And so I just like it was a perfect one for this portrait. Grace Jones, I had so much fun writing this bio. I wonder if I can like pull up a little bit of it quickly. I had a lot of fun writing this bio. Mm -hmm. I love writing about music. I love writing about um, music artists and um, Grace Jones career. She's really like in a multidisciplinary artist in many ways. So it was really amazing to talk about both like her um, Jamaican roots and also just her place within um, disco music, electro music, um, Car Caribbean music, house music. Um, and, and how she's contributed within these genres that we're talking about today with Renaissance, which is, you know, an, an album that she's on today with, um, with Beyonce. And so uh, I think to me, it's almost, I, I almost feel like when you read this bio, you almost get and understand why she's on Renaissance in many ways, because her work um, is almost, is, is not only timeless, but it was also very forward thinking. She was someone who was really committed to her craft and not always like the the quick hits and in, in, in the quick singles, you know, she she loved creating bodies of work and she loved um, performing on stage. And for Grace Jones, for the for the uh, portrait, there were so many ways that I, you know, wanted to do this one because she has all the outfits that she wears and the makeup and the just so many cool hats that she wears as well. But I chose to you know do the more simple focus on like the blush that she always does on her face and the makeup that she she has is kind of iconic that you you know her for and will instantly recognize her for. Um, but yeah, I really love Grace Jones. So this one was a tough one to keep it simple, but I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Toni Morrison, this is a very um, daunting bio to write because to write about an, another writer and then a legendary iconic writer as Toni Morrison was like, got to make sure I've, I've, I've got it together myself when I do this. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But for me, the hard, the, um, one of the more challenging parts about this bio was, um, was I, I wanted um, Toni Morrison's like, I, I've always felt that Toni Morrison has had this demeanor or, or mindset that was often around like holding up a mirror and creating work that, um, you know, is about black folks, about, um, about black folk, about black folks, about multidimensional black folks, um, and, and, and books that were for black people, but were really for everybody. And how ultimately I felt, I feel that like her books really did this justice of, um, you know, finding a piece of yourself or maybe even something that you are like struggling with or have contention with within yourself within her books. And so I wanted to really like have that part of who Toni Morrison is um, come up in addition to her love for um, for black people and, and for black history as well. I also like something else I, I really wanted to do, and this was more of, of, of a love of mine, but I wanted to, um, to also include um, the anthology that she that she works on, um, are, are the Black Book that she worked on in 1974. That was essentially like this this curated culmination of of news clips of different documentation of Black culture at that time. And I think and I feel like we've um, today seen different iterations um, of that. Like one book that comes to mind is is like even like Black Futures. You know, to me, I feel like the Black um, or the Black Book has inspired us to really understand how to. Um, document and also reimagine. So anyways, that's a tangent, but I love Toni Morrison, especially <laughs> for all of her books, but especially for um, the Black Book. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I think Darian said a lot of things that I would have said about Toni Morrison, but I think um, this one, I'm, when we're thinking of the visuals, it's more about the hair that I, I always think about like what part took me the longest, what part I was having trouble um, landing on. Uh, when working on this and so this one I know the hair took me a while to get the colors to match properly with the hair color and the skin tone and the balance with blush and her lip color um so I'm really happy with you know how everything turned out with this one Lapita Nyong'o 
is um, was someone who I think the the main point that I wanted to get across in her in her bio is how intentional she is about the roles that she plays in the initiatives and efforts that she um, takes on. I feel that she is someone who is really always going to be present um, within Hollywood in a way that is not just about her being a big star who gets you know tons of uh, great box office reviews and people go and see her movies. I think that she has really done a good job of like intertwining even like the fabric of her own background um, mm -hmm. as a way to like connect with others through acting, so. Yeah, for Lupita's, um, this one I really love the way it came out. It's one that I wanted to put on my wall for a while. I just love the balance of the colors and the lavender with the yellow and then the kind of positive and negative space with the color, um, the way that that came out. And that was kind of something I did by accident, but I was really happy with it afterwards. And I think it also plays along with a lot of the types of Film that she films that she is part of that have like double meanings to them sometimes, and there's a lot of things that you have to like you know go back and rewatch to to see or pay attention to in more depth. Um, but yeah, this one was really fun. I love the earrings and uh, just yeah, I was happy with how this one came out. Issa Rae, modern day icon, multi hyphenate creative, executive. Mo tr truly a mogul, like an actual entertainment mogul. Um, it was honestly such an honor to write this bio and to almost encapsulate it. And actually to, uh, you know, I really tried to do this thing where, you know, I, I list I list awards and honors and firsts, like I, like I do all of that, but I also really try to add in like these little lessons that I feel these women have taught us or that they've literally told us about. And one I feel is really big with Issa Rae was like networking across, she talks about in her career and how she, you know, instead of always looking at the people people she aspired to be and tried to get her work in front of their eyes, she worked with her peers to create incredible work that caught the attention of people who, who you know, she wanted to work with down the line. And so shout out to Issa Rae basically. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really love Issa Rae. Um, for this portrait, I mainly wanted to, I thought about her smile. She has like a really great smile. And so making sure that was like showing through in the portrait um, was something I wanted to to get through. So that's Issa Rae for my end. Sister Rosetta Tharp was incredible to, um, again, I love writing about, about artists and I felt that she was someone who, um, is an icon and considered an icon, but we don't always talk about her with, with within that zeitgeist. And so it was kind of just great to um, to pull her in specifically from her era, how she's influenced um, uh, rock, especially um, her background in gospel, um, you know, how she was performing at churches and she was also, you know, had her own tent, you know, like tent concerts as well. Um, and how, you know, she really um, found herself in, um, just at these intersections, which I think just being women, being black women, we, we often do with our interests where people often tell us, well, if your values are here and you're in the church, you, you're not supposed to be um, within these secular spaces. And she was someone who, um, who, who crossed that line and really created um, a, way for her, a, a way for herself and a career that felt very reflective of, um, of who she is, so. Um, this portrait, I remember this one was, a. Uh one of the more difficult ones in that there weren't a lot of photos I could find online that were in color. And so I had trouble trying to make sure I get her skin tone right. I wanted to make sure I had it accurate. And so that was a lot of searching and playing around um, with this one, but I'm really happy with how it came out. And I really love all the little details um, on it. We loved all the details on everything. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and to go through all of those photos and to hear you know what you guys have to say on the on the on your end it just i feel like i don't have any questions <laughs> i have comments but questions but i'm sure people want to know some of the things that weren't answered so we'll start we'll ask uh ask you a few questions we think people might want to know okay i'll go ahead and dive in can you talk a little bit a little bit about how you came up with the idea for black icons of her story? Yeah, so I guess um, there's this this book is a second edition of another book. So there was a first icons, which was you know all different women in history, and then we decided we wanted to kind of focus in on black women because there were just so many incredible black women in so many industries that have done things that we 
a lot of people just don't realize that impact their everyday lives. And so, you know, when I was talking to my publisher after we finished the, the first book, we felt like this was a natural direction to go. And when we were trying to get the writer, I had a friend Darian and I was hoping she would be available so that we could work together on this. And I felt like she was the perfect person to write this book. Yeah, yes, I know. It was. <laughs> no, literally <laughs> when when I, I don't I think like Monica texted me like, hey, the publisher might reach out about this XYZ. And I was like, this is exactly what I want to be working on. So yeah. And yeah. it shows. It shows in the book. It's so good. It, it My so question good. is yeah. how long was the initial list of women that you wanted to write about? Like, and who were the hardest ones that you just had to leave out? Oh, <laughs> So it was honestly so tough. Like sometimes I had to like take days to think about it and process like someone I was leaving <laughs> off because I didn't want to. But um, uh, like a few like Erica Badu, um, Lauren Hill, uh, Missy Elliott, uh, Shaka Khan. Yeah. Um, I would like like we could totally write another iteration of like another volume mm -hmm. of this book. A um, music was, version. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You should. <laughs> Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah. So, <laughs> in the yeah. different genres, though. So you have a lot of books. You have jazz. You have blues. You have rock and roll. So <laughs> yep, keep writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was really, it was really tough. It was definitely. Um, we just started with with. We probably at first had at least like seventy to eighty mm -hmm. around there. Yeah. And then we just started and then you have to think start to think about factors around like, okay, let's make sure that it is a, a diverse group just in terms of like different industries and things mm -hmm. like that. So Yeah. Yeah, we were going back and forth through the list and like trying to see like how many we had in these categories. But I know music was a huge one that we like had mm -hmm. a very long list that we had to like squeeze it down so that we could make sure it was yeah. more yeah diverse in that way. Well, we anxiously anticipate the, the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All so, in good time. Monica, can you talk about your drawing style and how long it took you to van eventually land on it? Yeah, I'm trying to think where to start. So for me, I am trying to think where to start. So I went to college and I studied animation and design. Um, and during that time, I, I hadn't taken a lot of drawing classes before going to USC for college, um, which is surprising because I was in the animation program. But as I was working with mentors, um, they would often, they would encourage me to do things the way I liked. Sometimes, you know, I would think a piece isn't finished because it didn't look like something else that I had seen. But then over time, as they encouraged me to, you know, keep things the way that I liked, the way that I had ended up doing them, um, that kind of made me more confident in my style and also kind of doing exercises of trying to draw things that I see around my apartment. I'm around my dorm in in the style that I had. It helped me get stronger, and so that I could represent, you know, the different things that I wanted to draw in the style that I had. So it could be a longer story, but I'm trying to condense it. But that was really the main thing: is you know, being encouraged to do things how I liked them, versus to uh, versus how I felt like they had to be done. Oh. I love the bold. Can you guys hear me well? Choices that you guys. Make. So, I, I, <laughs> okay. I, yes. Okay, I wasn't sure if I was cutting out. Can you out. hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, Darian, I want to hear a little bit about your journey as a writer and journalist. Um, so, what was the pathway you took? The people that you wrote about had pathways that started one way and ended another. What was yours? <laughs> yeah. Well, growing up, I definitely was like, you know, a kid at the, like the kid at the library. And I really liked to read and I always liked to write when I was younger. And so when it was time for me to pick something to go to school for, I really picked journalism because I was like, well, I like to talk to people and it seems like I can do that if I do this major. So I'm gonna do this major. <laughs> that was basically, honestly, my, my thought process. And so, um, you know, I went to school for, for broadcast journalism and that really honestly put me more of a world of like learning how to be a multimedia reporter, how to be a multimedia journalist. So, um, you know, which just involves learning everything and then coming into, you know, graduating from school. I went to Emerson College in Boston, 
graduating, um, you know, we're coming, you know, we're, we're in the thick of like, you know, Twitter is being founded, social media, we're, we're just in the thick of like this new wave of social media. Eventually there's Instagram, Facebook, um, social media, um, and just things of that nature. And I started to think a lot just about how I wanted to incorporate that um, within my own career. Um, I started out actually like more working in newsrooms um, in breaking news and politics and like national, international news. And I was normally always like a social media editor or like the person who sent the push alerts or, you know, was like changing like the homepage, like very much that I was like a social media strategist within newsrooms. And then I got really interested in beauty. Growing up, my mom was also a hairstylist. So it was like, just like organically a part of my life. And then I got into beauty and I realized that I just felt like there was really a path to, um, to covering beauty from more of like a like a like a cultural and like socio political lens that like was not always about like brands and product and, and like in launches and things of that nature, but was like about culture and trends and our voices. And that's really how how it blossomed of just kind of like allowing myself within the media world to shape shift because the industry is always changing as well. And so and I wanted to stay on top of that. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I found myself where I'm in, in this place now where I'm writing and then also it still extends to, you know, being an, being an author and like in working on a book that's definitely very related to my to the work that I've even done within beauty writing. So. That's great. Uh, can you speak about how uh, your collaboration works and how long did it take for the both of you to put this book together? Yeah, I'm trying to think when we first started talking about it. I felt like it was um, like maybe like August of um, 2020. Would it be 2021? <laughs> maybe what year? Yeah, that would actually make sense. Yeah, it would because. And then we finally started working. Oh, this is hard. I would need to look at my emails and text. Yeah, it. no. August 2021, and then we, like, I officially started working on the book, I want to say, maybe in October, like, end of October, yeah. yeah. End of October, yeah. Yeah, and then I've, and then I finished all of the bios, November, December, January, February, March, April, maybe, maybe April or June, I don't, I don't 100% remember, but <laughs> around six to it seven months, time. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it took me time to get into a groove of like really learning how to write them. Like I got a little quicker towards the end, but yeah. Right. And for me, like since I, we had the porch on the first book, it was a bit shorter process in the first book, but there was still a lot of um, new portraits that we did. And there were times when I wanted to redo some of my other portraits. Um, but yeah, I want to say like the timeline was probably similar um, to get it all together. Mm -hmm. What was the hardest part about working together? <laughs> or was it hard? It's, that's the thing is, I don't know if it really was hard. Mm -mm, it wasn't. I yeah. felt like we would just like go back and forth on like, like I would tell Monica like, oh, I, I think I'm gonna like focus on like the air, like this, like for Janet Jackson, for example, I really mm -hmm. wanted to focus around her eras around like rhythm nation and control. And so when you look at the portraits, you know, it's like Janet Jackson and her rhythm nation costume. So I felt like it was more of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm thinking about writing about this or like the, you know, the, like this moment or something like that. And so like, you yeah. know, sometimes we would have moments like that, but mm -hmm. I think also for me, it was like, like knowing, like knowing Monica's like style and how like, and how like truly vibrant her work is. Like I, like to me, I was almost like, thinking of that and using that as inspiration for making sure that like the words just felt like um like the words in the portrait spoke to each other you know yeah 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 that's what i was going to say but i think the hardest part would be when we it were trying like to narrow them yeah. yeah that's probably <laughs> the hardest part i would say well it definitely shows the uh collaboration it was very thoughtful i had a hard time remembering this is two separate people with very distinct works, uh -huh. but it was it's it flowed very seamlessly. And I really just can't wait to read this to my daughter. And you know, at one point I was like, I want to read it to her. No, I'm gonna keep it for myself and uh -huh. indulge because <laughs> you know that was definitely Janet in my favorite era growing up. So I was like, oh my gosh, yes. So, but yeah, I know it was it was really great. The collaboration, I mean it 
whatever, if, if it was tough or not, you played it off really well and it translates beautifully on page, on the pages. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank um, you. So uh, what are some things that you know now that you wished you knew when you were first uh, started out in your respective field? My thought would be um, making sure, I, I guess, knowing the balance of work and play and relaxation and making sure you kind of take care of yourself outside of your work. Um, I think that's something that I've gotten better at over the years, but in the beginning, it's like you not sleeping enough or things like that or pushing yourself to a certain extent and then you're burned out and then you can't get as good of work done as you wanted to. Um, so I think it's making sure you take care of yourself and don't feel bad about taking care of yourself and giving yourself a break. That's something that I, I think it's been very helpful. Yeah, I would actually, it would be the same for me, realizing that when you rest and take and take breaks and knowing that you go through mm -hmm. ebbs and flows of life, you know, actually resting and taking breaks, it fuels your creativity the same way that research mm -hmm. or reading can. I think that it's mm -hmm. all like really, really necessary. And if I would have known that, I think I would have like taken like better care of myself and not always felt that, you know, every opportunity righted on like, um, right on these moments where I felt really tired or I, you know, um, while still showing up and doing my job really well. So I think it's really about mm -hmm. the balance of really learning how to take care of yourself because there's real value in it um, because it fuels your creativity and the things you want to do. I love um, that you guys talk about taking care of yourself. And a lot of us learn things later in life um, along the way, but it's important. And now we, um, hopefully we do it. Then we do it often. Um, but I really want, okay. So everyone that was selected to be in this book had either created or furthered some legacy to unify, educate, inspire generations past and present and in the future. So were you got were you folks um, part of the process of what information you leave out of the bios or was that entirely up to the editor? Oh, like leaving out or what do you mean? Like, um, I don't know. I mean, because everybody has so much more her story than oh, I understand. what fit in the bios. Mm. So yeah. if it started off 10 pages, how, <laughs> how do you decide, you know, how to whittle it down or who decides? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was me deciding, it was me <laughs> deciding it. for sure. Um, I, I found that I really wanted to, well, first of all, I had to come to terms that I knew that I wasn't going to be able to fit the entire history of Janet Jackson into like a 500 word bio. So like first I had to come to terms with that in my head. And then <laughs> once I did that, I felt like I wanted to, I tried to use accolades in a way that was helpful to drive home a point versus like, oh, she just had this title or this thing happened. Like, you know, what was this the result of, or what was the creative work she was doing? And it led to this accomplishment. So in, and in telling actually like, I really tried to focus on even like the process for a lot of these women. Like I talk about Aretha um, Franklin and I talk about um, like, like, res um, like respect. And I talk about, you know, like one of her greatest songs and how that song came to be in the process of like who she was and what she was going to. And it led to this and she had this career and these other things happen. So, cause to me, I feel like honestly, the process is the most valuable part. So if you can get a little bit of their process while they, of um, then to me, you like take something away that you can maybe take with you in your own process, you know? Thank you, well done. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Just kidding. 
(laughs) Speaking of process, though, like what fueled you while you were writing and um, illustrating this? Like what was like the best thing you ate and that provided that inspiration? Like, oh, yeah, I got to, you know, write this down about something or, you know, what music were you listening to? Because I know there's a lot of authors out there, you know, um, and artists out there that listen to certain music and that really inspires them to, you know, go a certain direction. So, uh, yeah. Can you tell us about like what? powered you through this? Um, for me, for the illustrating, I, I think I go, I, I cycle through so many types of music sometimes, but I do listen to classical music a lot when I'm stressed. And if I'm like, if I'm doing a portrait and I don't feel like it's going the way I would like, I might put something like calming on to like, help me just like clear my head and not have any words in my head and just have instrumentals. Um, so things like that. But I think what I was going to say when you were first asking the question is the thing that fueled me though was also kind of being re-inspired by all these different women as I was illustrating them and as I was looking at you know photos of them and things like that it was kind of taking me back and that was motivating as well um, seeing all those details from their past. Yeah I would say for me if I was in a stage where maybe I had writer's block or you know there were so many of these women, I was intimidated to write their their bios at first. You know, these are women who have been written about um, like time and time again in various ways. And so I kind of had to like, like shed the idea of what I felt like other, like other writers or other people might think and like remember the readers and like just serve whoever's reading the book really to make sure that like, okay, they're going to walk away knowing something more. And so Honestly, what kept me going was definitely like if I had moments where I had writer's block or I was like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here, but I'm not writing anything. I actually like love to go on YouTube and like whoever I'm writing a bio about, I would start to look them up. I would start to watch their music videos or I would watch some of their some of their idiot videos. And I would maybe like just look for things where like maybe I did already find it in my research, but I brought it back up just to almost like refocus me. So I like to actually like what helped me was like taking breaks but still doing mm-hmm. something that was like learning, but it was more of like, I'm, I'm watching it or I'm listening to it. And I'm really big on, on music. I love to make playlists. I actually wanna make a playlist that is like inspired mm-hmm. by like these women in, in this book. I like, yeah. I like need to make, I like need to make it, but <laughs> because even, you know, there are women on Spotify, like, like my Angela was on Spotify, like some of her spoken word is on Spotify. So mm-hmm. there are women who aren't, you know, who aren't musicians, but they're on streaming, streaming platforms. And so, um, I want to do that. And, um, and, I, and also I would say another thing too, that was like, that, that like really inspired me was, you know, in the, in the back of the book, there is um, like citations of, you know, basically like, like my references. And I really try to include also like other women who had written profiles, written magazine covers that like, I, you know, like pulled information from to find these little bits of information that maybe you didn't know about from like a really old vibe magazine that's like on Google books or from the library archive or from a book, you know, that I may not have, but I want to quickly look into, you know, virtually through the, through the library portal. So for me, I tried to like bring in those moments and that inspired me to that, like, just to show like, you know, these women like don't stand alone. They very much honestly like stand with each other and, and like a lot of their paths are, t- are tethered in these ways. Um, that I even try to show within the book. Like if you read the Angela Davis bio and you read the Aretha Franklin bio, you like, you would see that like they were, they were friends or like, you know, or they supported one another. So, yeah. I love that. Okay. I I think I have time for one more. We got time Mm -hmm. for one more. Uh, Yeah. And then we also had a question in the comments too. So go for it, Chandra. Yay. Okay. Um, Let's do the question in the comments first. Mine can really, really wait. It's so really someone awesome. asked, how were the color palettes chosen for the various women? And I know you spoke to that a little <laughs> bit, um, Monica, mentioning how you use softer hues and brighter hues. Uh, so, um, but we know there's a lot more than what we showed today <laughs> on, um, on the slide. So yeah, how was that process for you? Yeah, so when I use color, I typically, so typically, yeah, for portraits especially, it's kind of like the energy that I'm trying to get across when someone's looking at the portrait. So if I'm going to use a lot of contrasting colors, it's like a different kind of energy than if I'm using a lot of softer colors together. Um, and so it's usually kind of based on the personality of the person and 
how they come across to me. Um, certain colors also like, you know, symbolize certain, you know, moods and things along those lines. So I think subconsciously I'm also doing that. But a lot of times, you know, for color palettes, I I kind of just, I start with probably like the background color um, or it could be the outfit. If I know I want to put them in a bright outfit, I might start with that. It's like whatever my body's drawn to first, but it's either the outfit or the background. And then I'll go based on that and kind of play around and obviously have to balance it with the hair color and like any accessories I put on to make sure everything um, is going to show properly in the final piece. But I always, yeah, it's, you know, I guess sometimes I could be walking around at like a consignment store and see an old piece of clothing that has a cool color combination. And then maybe I'll end up using that in a piece or there was a time when I was really um, obsessed with this warm lavender color and I was using it on too many things. And so sometimes you see my body goes through phases of being really satisfied by certain colors and I'll use those a lot or color combinations. Um, but hopefully that helps explain a bit. It's a lot of craziness here and there. Any other questions in the chat? I uh, know, I think that was it. What's your question, Chandra? Okay, so my question is, was it intentional, um, the icons that you placed first, the first and last icons in the book, was that intentional or was it just random selection? Because Aaliyah's no. first. Yeah, it's last. just an alphabetical. I actually really oh. wanted to, yes, alphabetical, but that still brings up a good point like because there was a point in time where I really wanted almost like it to be a different order of like how some of the women were connected. Like I wanted to put like Aretha, Aretha Franklin and like Angela Davis ne like next to each other. And I wanted to put like Beyonce and Serena Williams next to each other because mm -hmm. they're very similar. They were like born in the same month. They actually grew, they didn't grow up the same way, but they had a, in, they had a similar family dynamic of them being lifelong trainees of what they do. So there was like a point where, you know, I, I wanted to put, um, I wanted to put like Aaliyah even like next to like, like Lil' Kim or, um, or, you know, like maybe Tina Turner goes first or, or Sister Rosetta Tharp, you know what I mean? Or Ma Rainey mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but we, it ended up just being like better just to put it alphabetical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It worked. It really worked. Yeah, what I didn't, didn't seem intentional. Yeah, it, 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 I opened it first thing. I'm like, Aaliyah, and I went to the last. I'm like, Oprah. I'm like, wow. <laughs> like, <laughs> I know. I do love that Aaliyah is first. I do still feel it's like, it, it does make you like question it because it's like, for me, like starting out with Aaliyah was like, I don't think I even realized it until I saw the proof of like, oh my gosh, that is a way yeah. to lead a book, honestly. Mm -hmm. So, right. Yeah. Yes, my, my kids have a history lesson coming up soon on this. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take it easy now and just move into some rapid fire questions. Please don't think too hard about it. Just answer okay. however you feel in the moment. <laughs> and go ahead, Chandra, dive in. Would you rather be a bird or a mountain? A bird. I think a mountain. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> If I just think it would be cool to, to so I just think it would be cool to be able to fly. I know when I was younger, well, the first time I ever went in an airplane, I thought I was going to be able to roll down the window and like touch the clouds. And so mm -hmm. that brings me back to that of like, maybe then I could do it if I was a bird. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> okay. So if you needed to hide an elephant, where would you do it and why? <laughs> oh my goodness. If I was in LA, where would I? I'm just gonna think about it. Like, oh, if I was in LA, where would I hide an elephant? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I would hide it somewhere obvious that you wouldn't. I mean, I would hide it like in plain sight. Is how I would think about it. Me too. In some I'd like drop it off in the over like park and run away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make okay, it like very obvious so. that people just would like think it's normal. Yeah. If you could be trapped in any book or movie forever, which book or movie would it be? That's intense. Mm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, oh, that's hard. Cause all the things I keep thinking of have a downside. I know. Um, I mean, Besides I like Wakanda, you know. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. dream life. Right. I, I don't know. I want to I wanna be trapped in like an animated film, but I'm just trying to decide which one that would be the most exciting. If not have so stress. Bad. You have something to think about today. Yeah. Like a Studio Ghibli animated film? Or like those digital I, ones, like Pixar. I, or, you know, I was thinking like a, a digital one. <laughs> I was thinking a digital one. Like I keep thinking of Inside Out and also Zootopia, uh -huh. but Zootopia had like some scary moments. But I guess they solved it at the end, so maybe it wouldn't be a problem. But it, I just thought it was a very cool movie. Um, so thank you that one. <laughs> I don't know now that I think about it, I feel like I want to be in like a black exploitation film or like something from the seventies or like eighty, like disco. Like I would just want to be like, oh. like, like in shaft, but like not in the storyline. Like maybe just like someone hanging out at the bar with the afro, like just hanging out, but like in that era. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's what I. That's where I would be. That's yeah. <laughs> Well, it's actually one of our questions, too. I think that would be our last one for this evening. Like, if you could have only one entertainment from one decade, which one would it be? Would it be, like, the Shaft era of that for you, Darian? Yeah, I love I love the 70s and the 80s and, like, in disco um, and funk. And, like, so that's mm -hmm. where I would see myself, if not in, like, the future, you know? I would probably do, like, 90s Disney Channel stuff like in Nickelodeon, oh, all of that forever. I mean, I always put it on repeat now that it's on Disney Plus and whatnot. I'll just have it on while I'm working old shows that I used to watch um, that just bring me joy. So I think I could do that actually. I love it. I, I thank you guys. I would love to thank both of you, um, Darian and Monica for joining us today. I hope you really enjoyed this conversation. Um, and we want you to remember to visit lapl.org forward slash events to see more of our amazing program. Check the Your Author landing page at lapl.org forward slash your author for our next author program, which is on Friday, February 24th at 4 p.m., where we welcome author Janae Mark. The Los Angeles Public Library is excited to host author Janae Marks as she talks about her latest middle grade book, On Air with Zoe Washington, an empowering and big hearted sequel to the critically acclaimed book from the desk of Zoe Washington. And we also want to mention that the Los Angeles Public Library is celebrating its 150th anniversary. So please check out the 150th celebration landing page at lapl.org forward slash 150 for all the upcoming events and also join the 150th anniversary challenge. Until next time, we truly appreciate all of your support. The success of all of our library programs could not happen without viewers like you. So thank you. Thank you.